večer, mé jméno je Jana Vinčová, jsem z Czech Designu a dovolte mi, abych vás přivítala dnes bohužel naposled u uh, našeho uh, přednáškového večera, našeho pravidelného cyklu Budoucnost Designu, který uh, za pos- kterému jsme se věnovali poslední rok a půl a díky kterému jsme se mohli přivést uh, ty nejvýznamnější odborníky, osobnosti, kteří se věnují budoucí, současným a budoucím otázkám designu vůbec. Uh, za toho dnešního hosta těšíme také švédské ambasádě, uh, jeho zástupce mezi námi vítám a hnedku předám, uh, předám slovo na úvod. Uh, celý cyklus byl podpořen norskými fondy, kterým tím, uh, tímto dnes uh, také bohužel naposled veřejně děkuji. Uh, tématem dnešní přednášky je konkrétní jeden konkrétní materiál a tím je textil. Naše pozvání přijala pedagog, pedagožka, mladá pedagožka z jedné z nejprogresivnějších vzdělávacích institucí na textil vůbec a tím je Swedish School of Textile. O své uh, praxi jsem projektu Smart Textile, uh, textilích, technologiích uh, nám uh, řekne paní Rika Talmanová, se za chvilku předáme slovo and now I would like to ask you, Amelia, from Swedish Embassy in Prague, to say a few words on the beginning. Thank you, and I should start by apologizing because I speak no Czech, so I to bear with me. I want to, on behalf of the ambassador, say a sincere thank you to the Academy and to Czech Design for organizing this open lecture. It's been a little bit of financial help from the embassy, but we have done no work because that you have done, and, and we are eternally grateful for, for that. We hope that this is going to be the starting point of a cooperation between Sweden and uh, the Czech Republic on the issue of, of design. And so I very much look forward to this uh, lecture by, by Rika. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, so thank you from my part as well for inviting me here uh, to keep this le- lecture and the workshop. I'm looking forward to working with the students tomorrow. And uh, yeah, as I said, my name is Rikka Talman and I come from the Swedish School of Textiles in Sweden, Buros. Uh, I have an MA in textile design and now I'm doing my PhD in textile design at the Smart Textiles Design Lab in Buros. So I'm doing research and I'm teaching. Uh, my research focuses on how inherent changeable qualities could be embedded into textiles to create materials that change irreversibly over different time spans and how these changes could look like. Um, so I've been working with how different materials can be combined with textile structures to create expressions that change over different time spans. So uh, I thought I would begin just telling a bit about our school. Uh, the Swedish School of Textiles was founded in 1866 as a weaving school and it has currently about eight, 900 students from all over the world in seven undergraduate programs and seven master's programs. The school is nowadays part of the University of Burås and is situated on the west coast of Sweden close to Gothenburg. Uh, the programs focus on textiles and they are divided into three areas, design, engineering and management. The facilities feature modern lecture halls because we just moved into a new building two years ago and well-equipped laboratories that cater for everything related to textiles. So the school offers education on BA, Master, plus we're doing research in all three fields. I was thinking if I get the link working I could show you a picture from the school. So this is dying and finishing. Lab. 
So all, all the students in all the programs get introduction courses into the different labs and then after that they are free to do projects and work in them just by ag agreeing with the studio masters that oh I would like to do a weaving project and then we make a plan for what they would like to work with. So they work quite independently at the labs. This is the knitting lab. What's good thing about the facilities is really that the students actually have the possibility to experiment in, in industrial scale. So instead of just doing production, they can do experimental projects and develop textile techniques and develop those techniques like directly in the machines. So that is an advantage definitely for them. And the printing lab. and get back to our presentation. So, I think we'll leave the other film. <laughs> it was too challenging. A bit about the research done at the Swedish School of Textiles. Uh, we have research in various fields in textiles. There are two major research directions, smart textiles, which I'm part of, and fashion, function and futures. Inside these main themes, research is carried out in the fields of such as textile technology, textile management and textile and fashion design. Uh, the University of Puros carries, is, carries a national responsibility for research within textiles and fashion. Uh, and research done within the Smart Textiles Initiative spans from basic research in materials, technologies, and design to developing prototypes. Research is also done in collaboration with companies, and the aim of Smart Textiles is to be an actor between the business-led development projects and experimental research at the university in Burat. The projects include, for instance, fabrics that purify water by using only sun as their energy source, clothes that can measure bodily functions such as EEG or heart rate, and knitted blood vessels, which this is an example of, that can be used in bypass operations, or recycling cotton waste, such as old jeans, into high quality yarn. So not actually a new real product and not just some filling material. So it's not a downgrade for the material to be recycled. A bit more of what I'm going to talk about today is related to my research and uh, it's about textiles with changeable qualities, like I said, and how textiles could be perceived as dynamic instead of static. Because textiles change and wear out over time and in use, and yet they're usually designed to be retain their appearance for as long as possible. The textile comes out of the fabric, the store, and this is the finished product. Uh, so this means that the lifespans of a textile object and the material it's made of will not necessarily be equal. The dynamic changeable qualities in textiles could instead be enhanced by using the potentially dynamic changing qualities inherent to materials such that wool felts uh, and combining them with textile structures and through embedding different time spans into textiles instead of designing static expressions 
the lifespans of the materials and the textile objects could perhaps be better matched, enabling the designer to tailor a more appropriate lifespan for the textiles. So instead of thinking about designing the aesthetics of a textile, you design the aesthetics of the whole lifespan of the textile. Uh, the background for my research is that I feel that people's relationship to material has changed. Albert, Bo Albert Boriman, who is a philosopher of science, argues that today's consumption has become detached from the context of production. Products can be readily purchased from stores and the manufacturing processes behind their existence remain largely invisible to the consumer. Also, Annie Albers, which you may, some of you may know, wrote that production has become segmented so that people become experts in a specialized field, but the overall picture becomes harder to perceive. Also, devices have become so complicated that the processes behind their functions become abstract to the user. At the same time, they have made performing different things easier and effortless. Boriman calls this phenomenon the device paradigm. For example, compared to writing with a pen or a typewriter in earlier times, and writing text and pro yeah, writing and text processing has become more effortless and easily available. A laptop can be used for writing documents, but how it actually functions is not evident from the device itself. When you write with a pen, you understand how the words are formed, but with laptop, you press a button and somehow letters appear. According to Boriman, the result of the device paradigm is paradigmatic consumption, which lessens people's engagement with material reality. For example, garments are today often used as a way of shaping one's identity, and they are presented in a visual form in, for instance, social media. Annie Albers pointed out a similar phenomenon already at 1947 when she wrote that with the industrialization, people have lost connection and first-hand experience of the material world. So if paradigmatic con consumption can be defined as enjoyment without effort, it could be watching a telev television show or buying a new garment to shape your identity without the strain of actually reflecting on your identity. So you can buy new garments and kind of shape your identity with them, but you have, we don't actually know today how the garments are made, who made them, and what are they made of, even. So they become pictures of, or representations of something instead of actual physical objects. So uh, with the need of investing effort into achieving things removed, it has become easy to consume commodities in search of a good life. This phenomenon, when products are designed to be replaced in order to sell more products, could be called planned obsolescence, a phrase coined by Vance Packard in his book, The Wastemakers, at the end of the 50s. In 1965, Annie Albers again reflects on calculated obsolescence and the role of designer in writing in writing that as today's economy is built upon chains, a designer trying to create timeless forms best suited for the object instead of following the latest trends, finds himself in conflict with the economic pattern of our time. Albers argues that people are urged to continuously want more and more newer things, and a designer taking a longer lifespan approach might not be the most successful one. So the discussion about the long-term sustainability of the increased industrial mass production is by no means new. Still from the 50s and the 60s, the speed and the amount of production has just increased. In one way, there seems to be an imbalance between the materials and the objects' lifespans. The lifespan, they don't necessarily meet. If you think of a t-shirt, it could be made out of cotton, which in itself is a very durable material. Then it's processed into a low-quality t-shirt in really, really thin jersey and bad chewing work. So after a few washes, it already starts looking bad, and then you don't kind of want to have it anymore because it's breaking down. But still, the material in itself is really durable, and it's not actually disappearing anywhere. So... Kate Fletcher proposes that garments could 
instead, depending on their use, have various lifespans ranging from fast to slow. <coughs> and defining these rhythms relates to recognizing for which purposes garments are required. Fashionable clothes that are used for a short time could be made out of short-lived or recyclable materials. Less trend-sensitive garments, such as winter jackets, could last for a long time and age beautifully, becoming more personalized with use. Jonathan Schapman suggests that textiles and garments could be designed to improve with age, such as a pair of jeans that user molds their own through continuous use. So embedding fast or slow lifespans directly into textiles could help to create a better balance between the material and the textiles lifespans, where both of them could be considered already during the design process. So this would mean that time also has to be considered as a design variable. Alternative approaches to consider also timely aspects of artifacts have already been explored. Now the Fukasawa and Jasper Morrison have been exploring the notion of supernormal objects. They define supernormal objects as things that work so well that they become invisible to us. We don't need to think about using them. One example they lifted out uh, was the orange fisker scissors, that, that the scissors, they fit hand so well that you don't actually have to think about cutting, you just perform the action. So perhaps these kinds of objects could supersede somehow the need to get new things the whole time if we don't have to think about them. These were shown in an exhibition in London in 2007. Great Ivan Helmond's degree work from the Royal College of Art in London approaches long-lasting, highly valued objects from its opposite. As a comment to the current consumption patterns and how durable and valuable raw materials are used for producing items that are only used for a short time and then discarded, Van Helmond produced jewelry by growing sugar crystals on thread. These crystals appeared valuable and beautiful, but they were in fact made of everyday ingredients contrary to the valuable materials often used to produce things that are only used for a short time. The cherry was produced by sinking threads into saturated sugar solution and letting them stay there for weeks, in which time the sugar crystals formed on the threads. A few more examples with how artifacts change, that change over time as a part of their expression. These are Puma sneakers by Emma Whitting, she has embedded an emerging pattern into her sneakers so that the new product is seen as a starting point and when it wears out and gets dirty, a pattern emerges. And this kind of also connects to our interaction with the things that we own, that you have to commit to actually wearing the shoes and letting them become dirty for the pattern to emerge. She describes the pattern as an evolving narrative experience. Another example from the same school is Laura Bathan Root's degree work, Stain Cups, a series, a series of white coffee cups that have an emerging pattern inside them. Over time, coffee cups develop stains anyway, which may be experienced visually as a downgrade, even if the cup in itself is fully functional. So the designer has taken this unwanted quality and consciously worked with it, with its expression instead. So the cups have a pat pattern of glazed and non-glazed areas so that they suck in color in different ways. The color and the position of the pattern also vary dep depending on if you drink tea or if you drink coffee and how often and how you fill the cup. Uh, Tom Dixon's eco -verb presents an, an, one example of this type of change that has actually made it into production. It's tableware made, up, made, tableware made out of biodegradable plastic that gradually wears out from use. After about five years, the material can be composted. Dixon argues that this character, in fact, makes the tableware more interesting and unique to the user who molds them over the time although he has admitted that there has been certain resistance from customers to the idea that a designer product should only last for a limited time. Uh, Helen Story and Ra Tony Ryan created dresses made out of synthetic water-soluble material called PVA. 
for installation disappearing dresses in 2008. The dresses are exquisitely crafted with time-consuming methods, and yet they dissolve when they are dipped into a bowl of water. The work comments on the present way of life and production, where things are getting used up exceedingly fast. Hussein Shalayan, on the other hand, has worked with aging and wearing out garments in two collections. His graduating collections, Tangent Flows, from 1993 and following Cartesia. He sprinkled iron filings on the garments and subsequently buried them for several weeks, so they look really tattered. For Shalayan, <coughs> treating garments by burying them was a method for storytelling, and also he has stated that the processes are for the designer and the result, the ac yeah, the processes are important for the designer but the actual result, the garment, is what is most important for the people because they will not be looking at the process, they will only be looking at this. What all these projects do is that they in different ways challenge the way in which we perceive textiles and products. Textiles are usually meant to retain their expression for as long as possible also, quality testing usually aims at retaining things as new. No abbreviation from the original state is good quality. Uh, yet faded colors and worn out materials will always occur in textiles over time and use. So instead of seeing artifacts as something static, they could rather be approached as something dynamic. That the fresh, out-of-the-box artifact is not necessarily the finished product, but rather a starting point that evolves into something else during its lifespan. If a textile or an artifact is not static, but dynamic, it means that also the design process of these artifacts has to take this into consideration. How will the textile change over time and use? How can changes in expression be predicted or steered by the designer? Time, must also be, ha time has to also be considered as a design variable alongside with material, structure, and after treatments. So instead of designing a static textiles, a textile lifespan is designed. To get a bit more specific research project done within my research group, the Smart Textiles Design Lab, have been in different ways dealt with dynamic qualities in textiles. Dynamic qualities in textiles can be divided into reversible, something that goes back and forth between two stages, and irreversible, a change that only goes in one direction. And here's some examples. Yeah, here are some examples of both. Marian Koroshnia has been working with exploring possibilities for creating dynamic, reversible patterns with the help of thermochromic colors. So the colors react to temperature, and these fabrics can go back and forth between two or several stages, depending on changes in temperature. This design is an example of a mask for measuring fever in people. So if the person has high temperature, the mask will change color with the reading. Hannah Landin, Anna Persson, and Linda Vorbin have also used dynamic qualities in textiles as tools for interaction design. Their burning tablecloth is a tablecloth that reacts to incoming phone calls by burning up in random places. They, <laughs> they used a non chemical burnout technique to create a structural and color changes in textiles by supplying heat through the fabric in certain places embedded in the knitted structure, the fabric's expression can be affected after its production. Depending on the amount of, uh, amount of heat and material of the textile, the marks left on the textile can vary between color change and breaking and melting of the fabric. As the fabric burns from the impact of heat, the change process is irreversible. And the amount of heat was kind of dependent on if it's a mobile, Call, or if it's an SMS, so then it's like smaller thing. <laughs> the tablecloth makes people more aware of having mobile phones with them in the dining table if the host's tablecloth gets destroyed by their calls. <laughs> At the same time, the tablecloth became a way of presenting information in an alternative way. It shows the history of what's it been true. Delia Dumitrescu and Anna Vorbin and the passion worked with shrinking, stiffening, and breaking knits in their project, <coughs> Knitted Heat. Their collection touching loops included three knitted structures 
One of them became warm and shrunk, changing the surface texture of the knit. One turned from soft to hard when heat stiffened parts of the structure, and one shrank and broke when it was heated. The materials were developed within the concept of interactive tactility, with the aim of extending the aesthetics of textiles by working with changing textile properties. They reacted to touch by heating up and changing the structure, and due to the conductive material in integrated in the textiles, they were able to sense the location of touch and changes were directed to those areas. So it was actually changing where you touched it. And that's also a bit the area of where my research moves in how you can design textiles with expressions that change over different time spans and how good these changes look like. I've been working with a range of qualities from fast to slow and radical to subtle. Intensity in this case refers to the radicality of change happening in the textiles or the objects. I should maybe mention that the research we do at the design lab is practice-based research, and it means that we do practical work and then we re re reflect on it and then go back to practice. So it becomes kind of a, this dialogue between thinking and doing. My original starting point for, for exploring textiles with dynamic breaking qualities was to explore the meaning of sustainability and durability by working with the opposite, things that are fragile and break down. I started with more instant or short-lived changes, explored breaking and changing qualities in textiles, first in the context of home textiles, through everyday textiles such as placemats and kitchen towels that behave unpredictably by breaking or changing when they are used. This one here is a kitchen towel that becomes a bag when it's washed. And I actually handed it out to people, just kind of, oh, could you please test this new product of mine and see how it reacts when you wash it and is the quality good? And then kind of gathered their quite surprised reactions. After that, I continued exploring breaking and changing qualities in relation to the body with more focus on how the textile's expression would change when it reacted. And I'll come back to this later. I'm going to talk a bit more about one of my projects. If you're interested to find out all the details, you can read the whole article. It can be found in the proceedings of the Tangible Knowledge Conference held in Kolding, Denmark, last October. Uh, the project explored the relationship between potentially dynamic materials and textile structures for designing textiles with inherent change in qualities. So no electronics, but the change is somehow embedded in the textile material itself. This one we actually went to. Yeah. Yeah, the starting point for the experiments was an interest in how irreversible dynamic qualities could be embedded into textiles during the design process and to what extent it is possible for the designer to control these changes and how they might look like. So I worked with uh, two materials with differing dynamic qualities. These are polyvinyl alcohol, PVA yarn, and it's a material that melts when it comes to contact with water over plus 20 degrees so in room temperature, basically. And uh, the other one was uncoated copper wire, which creates a patina when it reacts with air. These materials were combined into woven and knitted structures and then exposed to two types of stimuli to explore how different stimuli affect the way in which the materials change. One was passive exposure to weather, and the other one was an active workshop with fashion design students. And this is an overview of the experiments. So I worked with both the material and structure and how the textiles could change using passive and active methods. Experiments A and B, this is just a quick overview, explored the role of material and structure in woven textiles exposed to passive changes by setting them outdoors. Experiment C in the middle compared active and passive methods of inflicting changes on a three-layered woven fabric. Experiment D focused on exploring in what way the textiles express and change and how these dynamic qualities affected the way they were manipulated. And this one, a set of knitted fabrics with a range of dynamic qualities was developed and an active method of causing changes in them was used. And this was the fashion 
design students working with the fabrics in a workshop. Uh, the initial experiment was on uh, the effect of exposure over different periods of time on how the textile will change. And uh, it was conducted on a knitted single jersey in uncoated copper and it was exposed to different things. One was buried in earth for one year. Other pieces underwent active changes, being exposed to vinegar in by both soaking and through evaporation in left in a, in a closed jar. And by the end of the experiment, like one of the materials had just completely, first it melted down, and after a year it became crystals. So it, one material turned into a different <coughs> material, but it still kind of has the form of the original material, even though it's not that one anymore. Experiment B explored the relationship between inherently dynamic material qualities and woven textile structures by creating changes in, it, in its expression over different periods of time. All samples were woven to an unbleached cotton warp on an industrial jacquard machine. In experiment B, B1, two woven pieces of the same size and materials but with different bindings were developed and left outdoors for two months. And this shows the pictures. On the left are the samples before being outdoors and on the right after. B2 is the same warp but with differ differing weft materials and all were outdoors for two months and there's the before and after as well. The first experiments A and B focused mainly on material qualities, their combination into textile structures and uh, observing how the structure of the textile contributed to how the material changed when subjected to the elements. The result suggests that Materials and structures, as well as different stimuli, afford the textile certain qualities that suggest different uses. They also reveal the evidence of textiles experiencing different conditions. So the textiles kind of change depending on the structure and the material. Some of them didn't change at all, some of them changed quite radically. Experiment C compared active and passive methods. So one woven material consisting of several layers was developed and uh, it combined an outermost layer of PVA, the melting material, with black cotton background and a hidden layer of stainless steel. The fabric was then subjected to different treatments. So one sample was placed outdoors for one month. One sample was sprayed with water and one sample was machine washed at 40 degrees. In experiment D, the knitted fabrics were developed with the aim of leaving the dynamic qualities open for other designers to work further with. Three fabrics with qualities ranging from subtle to explicit in expression were designed and produced. As this experiment explored how other people could further work with the textiles, PVA was used because it causes more instant changes in a textile, making it more accessible to work with. And the fabri fabrics were used in a one-week workshop called Crafting Wearables with the second year BA fashion design students at the Swedish School of Textiles. The aim was to see how other designers could actively work with the dynamic qualities. So one material was a completely breaking and disappearing material. One material went from being soft and textile-like to being hard and transparent. And one material, instead of breaking, could actually be become more when it changed. And here's some examples of the work that the students did. This is a poncho by Louis Jaroczewski, and where volume and form were created by stretching out certain parts of the fabric instead of creating volume in the pattern. A dress by Sophie Larsen where she combined the three-dimensional structured surface with sleek surfaces in the same fabric. So by manipulating the flat fabric, she got the really three-dimensional effect that you can see on the far right. And the third one is a multifunctional garment by Jon Daniel Isaacson, which uh, it can be transformed from a white pleated top to a striped long dress with the help of warm and cold water. So he was working with PVA in stitching and uh, thermochromic colors in the stripes. So first, when you dip it, you can open up the pleats 
and then when you dip it in warm water, it will become stripy. And the results of the experiments C and D indicate that the way in which the textile is formed and changed is at least as important as its material and structure. In experiment C, the sample exposed to weather showed the greatest potential for creating different expressions. In experiment D, the material and structure afforded certain types of changes, like shrinking, hardening, and breaking in the knitted fabrics, but how exactly the textiles were formed was decided by the fashion design students, and this led to a variety of expressions in the resulting garments. In the lower picture, you can see Sophie Larson's dress, and then an example of what I did with the fabric, in which it's completely flat still. So kind of people came up with com completely different expressions than what I had designed in the fabrics. So the fabrics kind of gives you certain possibilities, and then it's up to you how you use them, in which way. I'm just going to continue a bit on uh, what was the next step after this project. I got interested in, in longer time spans and how textiles change and wear out. So I did some experiments in setting textiles outdoors, burying them in ground and sinking them into the Baltic Sea and leaving them there for two months last summer. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this is a chacard woven patterned white fabric combining several different materials such as wool, paper, paper yarn and polyester. The one on the left is the original fabric and the one on the right is the sample after two months in the Baltic Sea. The one in the middle is the sample right after I picked it up. It was quite smelly. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the same fabric after two months on the ground. Uh, in these chacard patterns, the pattern turned from white to colored over time, which created a contrast between different elements of the pattern. The resulting color combinations of the same pattern were different depending on what the material had been exposed to. And it was really up to the material, choice of material, that they reacted in different ways, and even took in different ways depending on if they were in the sea or if they were on the ground. In the project, different types of changes were embedded into textiles depending on the planned method of testing. For example, the samples tested in nature consisted of, consisted of loose structures enabling them to be molded by the weather. Subtle changes in texture and colouring occurred over longer periods of time through repeated exposure. The knitted fabrics developed and used in the workshop had qualities that enabled them to be actively formed in different ways that would perhaps not translate as clearly if they would be exposed to nature. What they have in common is that when making decisions during the design process, the designer has to also consider time and the use of the textiles in the process. What kind of textiles, the, what will the textiles be suitable for? Also, information about material behavior is needed to enable evaluation of how textiles will change and how this will affect their expression. If we go back to Tom Dixon's eco wear, the bamboo plastic that was used in the table wear that wears out is actually the starting point for the whole table was, whereas expression from shiny to dull, so it, it gets a completely different tactility to use. In traditional design processes with static textiles, chance is usually sought to be eliminated so that the textile can retain ex its expression for as long as possible. Yet, textiles fade out and worn out over longer time. So the difference between kind of between textiles wearing out and specifically designing for expressions that break out or change is that aging is the aging process is taken to be a part of the design and its its effects on the textiles are tried to be anticipated and assessed. So it could be seen as designing for different lifespans instead of static objects. Uh, the textiles developed during the project are initial explorations into how materials with potentially dynamic qualities could be embedded into textiles by the designer. The results of the project suggest that the choice of material and the textile structure both have effects on how the textile will change. 
And then depending on the combination of materials, different lifespans could be embedded into textiles. The inherent qualities can give indications of how they might change. Wool felts, paper yarn perhaps breaks down easily, cotton is really durable, uncoated copper will change its color with air and humidity. So by choosing, so the textile designer has to have knowledge about materials in a more profound sense than just taking the one that is a nice color that is, or that is maybe the cheapest one, but actually have knowledge about how materials change to be able to, to create lifespans. And then depending on how the potentially dynamic material is combined with a textile construction, different expressions can be created. Yeah. However, the experiments revealed that the way in which the textiles are formed or changed is at least, is at least as important as the structure. This would suggest that already at the stage of making choices about the material and construction, the designer should consider the context in which the textile will be used. Embedding lifespans ranging from fast to slow into textiles could help create a better balance between the textile and the object when appropriate lifespans could be considered already during the design process. The textile designer does not estimate how long a lifespan could be, but actively designs it. Further research is however needed into how these textiles could look like under different stages of their lifespans, because this is an example of how it could like look like, but with different materials and a different binding, it could have been anything else. If I would have done something else with the textiles than putting them in the Baltic Sea, they would have been something different. I'm just going to show you a model. Uh, it presents an alternative way of relating to textiles, where of instead of seeing them as something static, they could be perceived as something dynamic. So this would mean that the textile changes in some way, and these changes happen in time. So they can be thought of uh, on gradient scales relating to the intensity and the speed of changes. I placed examples from my research on the scale to show how it could be used. To put it back to the context of sustainability, this approach proposes an alternative way of seeing textiles from a more holistic perspective, where change over time is taken as one quality of the textile. And through embedding different time spans in textiles, instead of designing static expressions, the lifespan of the materials and the textile objects could be better matched, enabling the designer to tailor a more appropriate lifespan for the textiles. Uh, that was what I had. If you're interested, here are some addresses to find more information, either about the Swedish School of Textiles, the Smart Textiles Design Lab. We have uh, our own blog, which is the middle one, stdl.se, and there you can find information about different types of projects that people are working on. And there is a link to the article if somebody wants to go through the whole thing. So thank you for your presentation and uh, for presenting us your very interesting work. I will open Q and A with the first question, mm -hmm. and I would like to know how is um, Swedish School of Textile linked with? Um, business with practices, how they can uh, use uh, your research re results, or how, how are you presenting them? How is the cooperation working? Mm, it depends on uh, what type of research you're doing. I mean, um, some of the projects that I've been doing have been funded by the Smart Textiles. And then they have a showroom in Burås, where they show all different kinds of proje projects both more experimental research and then actual products that are already out there. A lot of the smart textile projects are done in collaboration with companies, like the knitted blood vessel that I showed at the beginning from the technology side. That is done in collaboration with a company, and that is actually in clinical tests to be approved for actual use in the future. So when it comes to design research, 
the results are not directly applicable into products. It's more like on the design side, we're doing basic research in materials and structures and textile expressions in the aesthetics. And it's more like um, how I see the results of my own research, for example. They may maybe not be turned into product right away, but it's more like offering an, a different way of thinking, a different way of seeing things that someone else could take, take this way of designing textiles and go ahead and do some kind of a product with it. In regards to the materials that I was talking about now, mm -hmm. uh, the PVA, the melting material, it's not harmful. It's used in um, like medicine. If you have small tablets and you have some kind of a covering on the tablets, so that's PVA. And also, it's used in, um, in for example, in hospitals mm -hmm. where they ha get the dirty work clothes and something that you don't really want to touch. So they have laundry bags that are made out of PVA. So you put them in the bag, and. Uh, you can just throw the whole thing in the washing machine and the bag dissolves and you get the clothes. So it's not like, and I've had it, had it on my own skin, so it's not, it's not toxic, but of course it's a synthetic material. There is the polyvinyl part. So it's always like a, a question of, of balance, I think. So I wouldn't straight ahead go and make a bunch of things out of PVA, because I think in small amounts it's no problem, but then it still stays in the water mm -hmm. somehow. Maybe the materials that I use, it's more like um, I'm making propositions about how we could think about around textiles. And maybe somebody comes up with a better material that we could actually use for this thing. Mm -hmm. Like now I've been working with paper yarn, which is biodegradable and uh, much more less harmful to produce than, for example, cotton where it takes less water and less energy to, to produce it. So I kind of, I started with PVA and then I got interested in, in could there be other examples where I would kind of get rid of the synthetic part and I would also have kind of sustainability in the material itself, <coughs> so the paper, yeah, that's why I'm kind of interested in that and how it changes over different time spans. Because it kind of, uh, what I saw with the, burying samples is that it breaks down considerably faster than cotton. So it could be an interesting way of searching for balance in how long things should last or not. Yeah. 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 Okay, great, thank you. And thank you. There is a question. Yeah. Does the industry ever get, um, uh, approach you uh, with a problem that they want you to help solve? For example, you know, uh, jeans or uh, cotton t-shirts that uh, um, require an enormous amount of water in mm -hmm. the manufacturing part of it. Uh, do they ever come to you and say, you know, can you help us see if we can solve this problem using less water or less chemicals? Or mm, they haven't so far. Mm -hmm. I would <laughs> I would welcome them if they would. They have in the uh, approach the smart textiles. So they have been doing uh, some research on paper yarn as an alternative to cotton and how you could, because it's a bit rough in itself, so how could you get it to kind of resemble cotton more? And also this project uh, about jeans that I was talking about or mentioned at the beginning, that they have made a project uh, where cotton can be recycled into a completely new fiber, which is not a waste material and not a downgrade for the material, but it's actually, I've seen examples it was a bright yellow dress knitted out of this material. And it's like something between cotton and viscose. So in that sense, they are collaborating, but maybe with more with the technology side and management than with design. Thank you. I have a question. It's yep. almost the same thing that um, the lady just asked. Um, I'm sorry. 
of how is this able to, how is this actually, how can we apply this? For instance, as students, maybe, or uh, I don't know, you were a student, and I would like to, I have a few projects that I would like to use, mm -hmm. and I, don't, um, I just don't think it would be wise to put it in the ground mm -hmm. and see what happens to it, because I want to, like, I want a finished product out yeah. of what you are trying to do and apply it to my product. Yeah. How does that work? I think it could work in the way that uh, when you choose the materials that you're working with, you also consider like what's going to happen with those materials in time. You don't have to bury them for two months and see what happens. But more like, because uh, there's a lot of clothes, garments, for example, that are made of polyester and they are meant for to be a fashionable party top. And then you use them for a few months, they go out of fashion and you kind of get tired of them. So then you discard them, but the polyester doesn't disappear anywhere, it's a plastic. So it kind of stays around as a waste material. So that's maybe something, a way to apply it. So when you choose your materials, also think about not only is it cheap, is it available right now, uh, how does it look, but kind of try to find a balance between the aesthetics and what will happen with the material in future. Do you want people to use your garments for 10 years, or do you want people to have them only for a certain time? Mm -hmm. So maybe that could be, you don't have to go and do radical things mm -hmm. with that. This is more, it's more like a way of exemplifying what could happen with the materials, with the textiles, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think not like completely waterproof. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know the um, there is you can put kind of a wax coating or an oil coating on fabrics yes. that is quite waterproof. Yes, but it's, but it's not Yeah, I mean, uh, I, you can use wax mm -hmm. and you can use kind of, if you think of these pretty oil canvas jackets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, but they're not completely waterproof. So I think and that. They are breathable because if, if I look at the material, uh, mm -hmm. the album material, yeah. they are all synthetic. Like if you look at the garden, it's all yeah. the, 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 the super uh, thick material. Yeah, I mean, and the gore -Tex coating is so harmful for the environment, so it's not really a good. Mm -hmm good kind of an option. So I think uh, they haven't been able to find a good replacement for Goretex yet. Mm -hmm. right. But I think it's hard without any synthetics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you, Vika, one more time for your presentation. Thanks to Swedish Embassy for um, for the um, for the <laughs> and thank you for listening. Yeah. Thank you all of you that you came. <laughs>